Welcome to Leveraging Leadership, where we unpack the art of business leadership. I'm your host, Emily Sander, C-suite executive turned leadership coach. Gary, thank you so much for being on the show. It's uh, not every day I get to speak with an actual brain surgeon. So this will be a new one for me, but can you just start off and give our listeners maybe a, a one minute, two minute overview and introduction of who you are? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, by the way, Emily, for having me and I, I am honored, but uh, who am I? It, it all started when I was a little child. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> only kidding. Uh, I uh, was a neurosurgeon who practiced heavy clinical neurosurgery, meaning I spent a lot of time in the operating room through several decades at major medical centers and trauma centers, which means there's a lot of thrills and chills going on all the time. Uh, and I became the head of a program at Virginia Tech and uh, ran that for 16 years and retired a few years ago for a number of reasons. Uh, and since that time, I've been uh, teaching medical students and undergrads and writing books and a bunch of other stuff. Wow. Awesome. So just out of curiosity, what what is it like to actually operate on a brain? <laughs> uh, I, one, one way to describe it would be it's cool. I think uh, when I was in medical school, I uh, I was originally, well, I was originally going to be a number of things, but I had settled down on being a cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, had had my future all set up in that. And uh, I got to my last month in medical school and saw my first brain operation. And I went, oh my God, I've got to do that. Uh, and so the, the first word really is that it's very cool. Obviously, uh, it's challenging. It's filled with trepidation and and uh, abrupt changes in fortune, and uh, you know, every so often, a lot of awe that you are doing things to this, you know, this agent of all that we are, uh, and uh, and frankly, some I, I think you have to kind of block that out of your head most of the time what the ramifications really are of what you're doing and just see it as a problem to be solved and, and often a very vexing problem. Uh, so it is challenging. Uh, it is crazy. It, uh, it never ceases to fill you with awe if you let it, but you try to, you try to let it before and after rather than during uh, <laughs> and just get your job done. During, yeah. Um, so you mentioned, you know, what it made me, what you, what you said made me think of in our world, in my world, business. I, we often say, well, it's not brain surgery. You know, like let's calm <laughs> down. It's not actual brain surgery. You know, we're not, we're not doing anything. That's life and death. You can't say that. <laughs> uh, so what was it like to literally have life or death, or even the risk of serious harm come to one of your patients literally in your hands? Uh, it is definitely one of the uh, the key challenges of the field. I think there are many many offshoots from from your question. I think I, I've spent uh, more than a decade studying burnout in healthcare workers, neurosurgeons, but healthcare workers uh, in general. And it's certainly a great setup uh, for burnout to have that much responsibility in your hands all the time. But it definitely presents a challenge. Um, uh, and in neurosurgery, unlike maybe even cardiothoracic or uh, some of the other surgeries, uh, our outcomes are not guaranteed to be pretty good. Uh, they are often very bad. Uh, that, that, and what, that's a euphemism for saying people do really poorly, uh, sometimes no matter what we do. Uh, and so you are constantly battling a sense of guilt, a sense of less than perfection, uh, because it's being shoved in your face that uh, that people are not doing well despite your efforts. And then to add fuel to the fire, you know, your own your own errors, your own fallibility can make it even worse. So we spend a lot of nights staring at the ceiling, kind of replaying what we did in the OR. Uh, could we have done it better? What should we have done differently? And and so that's a part of it. And it's there all the time. I was 
I was just giving a talk to a bunch of neurosurgeons about retiring. And I said, even though I, I, I loved operating, I, I did over 13,000 operations and uh, I loved it. I was always looking for more, if you will, uh, as a, it's kind of an odd thing to say, but neurosurgeons get it. And since retiring, I don't miss it one iota, not a bit. I have not had one pang of missing surgery, which I found odd until I started thinking about it. And I began to realize that even the simplest of operations carried a level of stress. Even if it wasn't life and death, you were always trying to do your, your best and really expecting too much perfection of yourself. Everything was supposed to go perfectly. It never goes perfectly. Uh, and so that wears on you. It's there all the time. And to not have that, you know, kind of sitting on your shoulders all the time is a relief, I have to say. You talk about being imperfect and you sit at night and think about what, what you could have done differently over and over. And I've had similar experiences, again, not in the medical field, but that that resonates with my experience as a business leader, but you mentioned burnout and, you know, society is talking about self care more and how important that is to show up at your best. So you're serving those around you better. And what you mentioned just brings it to a whole nother level, right? So if you don't take care of yourself and if you don't do the things you need to do to cycle through the mental pieces or emotional pieces that are super stressful, you're not going to show up real well for your next next operation. So how do you deal with burnout in in your field where you know burnout could mean very significant outcomes? First of all, I I, I would say that I think it's always a, a little dangerous comparing stressors or adversity. You know, I'm on I'm I'm on an admissions committee for the medical for our medical school, Virginia Tech Carillion. Uh, medical school. And in fact, you're always asking the students, uh, you know, describe a case of adversity and how you faced it or how you handled it. And I, I, I think we, we subject uh, people to kind of a suffering contest. Who can have the worst adversity? And I don't think, I don't think it's valid. Yes, we dealt with life and death. I don't have to deal with you crashing a company, for example, and, and that sort of thing. And a lot of people depend on those companies for their livelihood and stuff. So I I just think I, I think the process is very similar. If and and if you are a highly motivated, intelligent person, you're actually more prone to burnout, uh, particularly if you're in a high demand field. And and the high demand doesn't have to be uh you know healthcare it it can be anything where where you i think so much we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and therefore we're always comparing our performance to what we were expecting of ourselves or putting ourselves up to be and that again that can be in any industry any field and anybody in any industry in any field can lie there awake at night and go Doggone it. Yeah. Why, you know, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I say that? Why should I? And so on. And, and it can go on and on. And, and you can ruminate like crazy. Now, I would say those are all, you know, evidence of burnout. And so I if you if you go to the books, burnout has some somewhat strict definitions, although I think they can be kind of broad, but I think it extends far beyond what we uh, what we put up in the the textbooks, or what you know, you, you can take a burnout assay and see if you actually are burnout or not. I think it goes far beyond that. I think when we see the people that we work with or ourselves, uh, particularly, not performing in in all our endeavors at a level that uh, we think we could or should we are beginning to encroach in the burnout world. And what I mean by that is, I think we often are not our better selves. And I think we start coming apart at times in our various uh, endeavors, where we start getting snappy at somebody, where we bite somebody's head off, where we somebody is talking and we just turn them off in our heads, <laughs> or we don't even bother to listen or we over talk them or we roll our eyes or behind their backs we critique them all these little behaviors i think are signs of burnout to one degree or another in that uh we're just not performing up to what we could and and should 
and I think we all feel a lot of constant stress and pressure put on us. And, you know, we just, some of our inner demons start to come out. Uh, and how I actually got involved in this was there were a lot of inner demons coming out amongst my team many years ago. And I was getting 30, 40, 50 formal complaints about my team a month. And I was, you know, trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do with them. And I began realizing that these may be symptoms of burnout. We started really working on it. And what was interesting is it took a while, but after a while, it, I mean, the narrative flipped. We went to basically zero complaints about the team. And all of a sudden, team members were winning awards all over the hospital for how wonderful they were and stuff like that. And it really, it really kind of cemented this, this uh, picture in my head that, you know, most of us are decent people and we want to do the right thing. And so if we're not, there's something behind it, mm, right? Yeah. You know, we're, we're having problems. So you did a, that's a, you wrote some books on this, I think uh -huh. three, two, three, three, yeah, so three on burnout. So what it says, burnout is universal across different industries. What, what turned that team around from 50 complaints a month to winning awards and being uh, glowing employees? Well, I, part of it was blind luck. Uh, and what I mean by that is I stumbled into a literally a world expert on physician burnout is a clinical psychologist, Wayne Sotil, who has treated thousands of physicians through the years. In other words, problem physicians would be sent his way uh, and uh, and he would work uh, with them uh, often because of burnout. I happened to stumble into him and I said, well, you know, you really want to see a you know, tremendous example of, of burnout and of work stress. Why don't you come hang with us for a while, <laughs> uh, which he did and very much to his credit. And uh, we came up with a battle plan and, and did uh, weekly uh, sessions with our whole team. And it's interesting, you know, at first, I, neurosurgeons can be quite a cynical group of people. And at uh, first, they're rolling their eyes and saying, this is crap. Why are we have to? Luckily, I was a boss. So I said, you are coming. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so uh, they, would, they, they would begrudgingly make it. After six months of doing this or so, they came voluntarily. They, they really enjoyed it. Anyway, to answer your question, uh, there is no single one answer. Um, and that is that what we found is that we, and we've worked through all sorts of various strategies. And what you learn is certain things work with certain people, right. uh, better, some better than the other. So you have to buy all my books to figure that out. No, <laughs> uh, uh, there are some universals. So, so and I think a, a couple of ones to start with. Well, I'm going to give you, can I give you an analogy first? Yes, I think please. it's it's one of the best analogies I've heard or descriptions of what goes on in burnout. And that is that we all have kind of a bank of, you can call it emotional energy, psychic energy, something, whatever it is that drives us, gets us going, gets us to dive into whatever we're going to do. But we all have that. And everything we do, every interaction we have day to day either makes a deposit in that bank or a withdrawal. And I bet you, you can name a hundred withdrawals, oh, you yes. know, at, at, at the tip of a hat, but there's also deposits, you know, you pet the dog, you, you know, you read a good book, you have a great cup of coffee, you know, that sort of thing as well. So anyway, I, the idea of burnout is a situation where you've made so many withdrawals that doing the normal things that give you deposits aren't making up for the imbalance. You are overdrawn. And therefore, the entire world becomes an effort. Everything that you normally would do and, and do with a flourish, it just feels like you're walking in quicksand. And I, I love that uh, analogy, um, or whatever you want to call it, metaphor. It's got to be a metaphor. But anyway, so I guess they, one of the answers is, how do you make more deposits? And there's a million ways. But uh, you know, we identified a whole bunch that are potentially very powerful. But to start with, I think to get out of the starting blocks, uh, there's a couple of concepts. One is self-compassion. 
and two is self-care and self-compassion means you have to be willing to stop and think and say how am i affected by what's going on today or by this conversation or by this interaction or by this argument or by this happenstance at at the business or uh, or my interaction with my mom or my, you know, yeah. <laughs> how is this affecting me? What are the things that affect me positively in life? What are the things that drag me down? Uh, how am I feeling right now? What do I need? Uh, can I go spread joy to the world or am I going to need some joy spread my way? And, you know, this, this also comes under the heading of emotional intelligence and hard driven uh, high achiever, very bright people are horrible about <laughs> self uh, compassion or emotional intelligence because they're focused on whatever the thing is, you know, at hand that that they're trying to drive. Right. So in your world, it you know, it may be a, a project or it may be, a, you know, getting a group to function better. Or, you know, you can tell me better than I can tell you in my world. You know, it, it's uh, it's obviously that I'm I'm trying to you know do the best for for people and 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 give them as good a care as I can and talk to them about their, you know, what. Uh, is going on with them and all that sort of thing, but we don't. We fail to focus on ourselves completely, and so we let ourselves drift, mm -hmm. and we can we can drift into some you know rough territory. So you know the first thing we want is people to to find the time, find the energy to periodically take account of themselves and what's what's driving them, what do they care about, what are the things in life that mean the most to them, how are they faring. Uh, what can they do to help out their situation? If you can get that off the ground, then you can get to the self-care component, which means acting upon it. It means saying, all right, you know, I really can't stand what I'm, you know, what I'm doing here. What can I do to change it? Or I'm really down. We, we, you know, what are the things that are going to uh, bring back some joy and engagement to me? So self-compassion and self-care are kind of uh, of the big starters there. And then you can get into a whole bunch of strategies, but a couple of the big hitters, I, I'll give you three. And like I said, I could give you 50, but I'll give you three right now. A, a couple of the big hitters. Uh, one is the maintenance of relationships. And I don't know about you. Uh, um, maybe you can tell me. Uh, in In these last, let's say, 10 years, do you feel like you are increasing in the people that you know you really care about and you interact with regularly are you decreasing or holding steady i would say i'm increasing and it was, there was like a dip during covid and then i came out of those <laughs> blocks like all right people where are all the people um so and and for my own life you know i i left my corporate job and went into coaching full time and that part of part of that was to spend more time with the important people in my life well, that's great news. So that's why you're not burned out <laughs> but... anymore. Yes, but I was because I used to be running on that corporate hamster wheel and at a full sprint. So, yes. No, but that's very good to hear because, well, I'm not going to, I'm I, you're not there yet. But once you hit middle age, there is a real tendency to start reducing those connections. Hmm. It is actually worse in men than, than women um, for one reason or the other. Men often end up down to zero, uh, you know, uh, but one way or the other, uh, because we're so busy, because we get so involved in whatever, and we're kind of at the peak years of our performance, um, we tend to really reduce those super close, important relations to us. And you say, you know, I, when's the last time you saw your best friend? Oh, I, you know, it was three Six years ago. ago. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it's like whenever we see each other, we pick up where we left off. But yeah, okay, right. But you haven't actually hung out for how long? Um, and uh, it's, it's clearly one of the contributors to burnout. Uh, it's actually, if you want to get into the, the clinical neuroscience, it actually contributes ostensibly even to dementia, or it's at least a protective thing against dementia to have lots of close relationships that you 
maintain. It doesn't have to be dozens, but it, the people you care about, you stay engaged with. And we tend to, you know, zero it out. And I, I, I mean, I can tell you that the, the people I know uh, are very much in that uh, category. Two more is, uh, one is the idea of what we call debriefing your stressors. Uh, so you got to have the emotional intelligence to start realizing what the stressors are. But then uh, to be able to have close, trusted people that you can sit down every so often and, and talk about a stressor and kind of allow the, the friction of that stressor, the pain of that stressor to dissipate, which it will if kind of released, if you give it the ability to, to put the boogeyman out there and, and face it. Um, and what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean sitting around and complaining. Right. What it means is to uh, understand how it affects us. And if it's affecting us really negatively, are there other ways to approach it, other ways to handle? So you may have one coworker that you are constantly at odds with, and it's, you know, it's driving you crazy. Well, step one is to recognize this isn't working. Something's going on here. Um, then to be able to debrief that with a, a trusted compatriot, if you would, but not to be sitting there and saying, well, he said this and then said that, and I said this and they said that. The details don't matter. It's for some reason we're oil and water. I, I can't figure out how to get off on the right foot. And that by A, releasing it, you release a lot of the negative energy. But by B, somebody might say, well, did you ever think of this? Yeah, yes. Did you ever try that? And it can go a long way. So debriefing stressors. And then the, the, the fifth one I'll give you is kind of the corny one. And we wrote, you know, we wrote these books about what we did and our findings and all. And one of the biggest critiques is, that came back at us was saying, oh, yeah, sure. Well, you know, you're just giving all these super simple solutions, these simple uh, methods to handle it. And we said, of course, if we made them complicated, nobody would even try it. So this is an example of you know, something super simple that, that is easy to do, but you have to remind yourself, uh, and that is to harvest what we call uplifts. These are the deposits and to harvest them. Uh, and what that means is you go through your day and you, th you, know, you th think about a physician at least, because I know what that, how that works. You can go through your day collecting negative things very easily. This this person yelled at me. This person frowned. The administrator wants more work. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, or you could look around and say, this patient thanked me. This family member was so appreciative that we spent some time telling them about, you know, their loved one. We had a great outcome for surgery. This patient that we that we fought you know, illness for three weeks on service is leaving today and looking good. You know, there, there are so many good things going on, but we've trained ourselves really to look for the bad stuff. In fact, we have to, we got to look for bad stuff to anticipate it, but we're not looking for any of the good stuff. So as you are, are harvesting these uplifts, if you make yourself look for them and maybe jot them down, I say jot them down. It shows how old I am, you know, with a, <laughs> with a piece of paper and a thing. Do a voice you memo look, into your phone, do something. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Soon you'll just be thinking and the electrodes <laughs> will pick it up and put it in your in your uh, phone. But, but collect them, you know, even just a few. What happens is you train your mind to start noticing them more. So all of a sudden your days start filling with more and more uplifts. And to get that kind of rolling, again, you may have to put little post-it notes or an alarm on the phone that says, look for some uplifts, write them down. When you get home that night, look over a few and savor the fact. In fact, there's good psychological evidence that if, you know, before you, you go to sleep at night, you think about three to five good things from the day that it really contributes to wellness and resilience. Um, so, it's an example of something very simple, but most people are not going to bother, and they're going to be no. I, you know, I need to be submerged in crisis. Well, yeah, you can <laughs> submerge in crisis. <laughs> the crises aren't going away, but the good stuff is there as well. Is it true that I've heard 
that our brain is just naturally inclined to look for the negative and emphasize it more because that's what kept us alive. You know, look for the rustle in the grass because that might be a lion ready to eat you. So any little negative thing we we encounter is amplified. And so you you need three to five positive things or uplifts to kind of counteract that. Is that true? Well, I you know, I wasn't around during the saber tooth tiger <laughs> days, uh, even though <laughs> even though I'm old, but uh... Uh, I think there is, a, you know, if you wanted the absolute, do we have circuitry for that? No, because we don't have circuitry for anything, you know, in other words, mapped out. But there's a lot of psychological evidence that, that that's very true. It certainly makes a lot of sense, right? And uh, we are always looking, you know, we have what they call coincidence detectors going on in our head. And, and sure, we're going to look for uh, potential threats for yeah. sure. And we're you know that I I know some people who maintain that we're not designed to be happy. Happiness is it's not a survival skill. Uh, you know, uh, avoidance of supreme sadness and death are survival survivor skills. But uh, it doesn't mean that we can't be happy. So so uh, why not work towards it? Uh, but it may take more effort up front. You're right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. When you were talking about your day and kind of the administrators and speaking to the the families and I'm sure the patients pre-op and post-op and things like that, how how many different constituents do you have to communicate to in a day or in a week? Because you know I have we have different constituents at, at work, you know investors, board members, press, you know management team, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got very different constituents as well, and people will hang on every word. So if if a family is waiting outside to hear how the surgery went, when you come out or whomever comes out and tells them, they're going to be, you know, <gasps> bated breath, you know, I'm going to hang on every word. So how do you go about communicating? Uh, yeah, another uh, another multifaceted uh, question, uh, for sure. A, there, there's kind of a, a, a little bit of a funny side to this in that uh, surgeons are awful, often disparaged on a number of fronts uh, <laughs> for certain characteristics, of which I would argue a lot of these characteristics are burnout characteristics, being gruff, being angry all the time, being overly directive, being, uh, you know, short with people, all that sort of stuff. But uh but, but there's a couple streams of of things that I always take exception to. One is there there they were often dis, they, some people talk about in medicine that there are cognitive fields and there there are more technical fields. And uh, somehow we fall into the technical field in that um, we're just kind of like mechanics. We go and something's oh. wrong, we tinker with it and fix it. But not we're not we don't stroke our chins and think hard about what we're doing. That's what the medicine doctors do and uh, the neurologists rather than the surgeons and stuff. And I'm like, are you kidding? You know, I hope you, you think hard about what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Get, get me in the middle of the brain and things are going poorly. You don't think we think we have to think and we have to think fast is, is a different there. Uh, but, but a corollary to that is that we don't talk to patients. And I'm, I'm like, I am going to operate on somebody's head. Do you think they volunteer for this? Or do you think that takes a long, in-depth, yes. multi-sessioned you know, uh, set of discussions? Uh, so I would argue we are very, very practiced in uh, talking to it. And as you say, all different types of I guess we could call them in, in I think, in your parlance, stakeholders, mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, uh, we talk to a lot of patients, obviously, a lot, hours and hours talk, talking to patients. Um, this is going to sound dreadful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's going to make me sound like an awful person, but it's just an example. Our clinics are always overflowing. We're always running over time. We get about you know seven to 10 minutes per patient sometimes. And I'll see it next person on my on my list has a newly diagnosed brain tumor. And I get a sinking feeling, A, for them, obviously, but B, because I go, oh my God, there's an hour just yeah. wedged into this crazy clinic because I can't talk to a brain tumor patient in five minutes. It doesn't work that way. You know, you have to discuss everything they need to talk about. Anyway, 
uh, also in our field, a lot of our people are badly hurt and injured and coma and that sort of thing. So you spend a huge amount of time with families. Yeah. You're always talking to the nurses. You're always talking to other specialists uh, that you're working with because you know, medicine's practiced by teams anymore. So you're always talking to team members. Go ahead. And just to jump in, sorry, I would imagine that in the OR, when something is going wrong, let's say, your communication style has to be very direct and very, you know, this is urgent. But then when you flip to talking to a family, that's perhaps more empathetic and a different tone of voice. Is that is that true? And then another question is, do, as doctors, do you get trained on that? part of the job or is it all the the medical pieces oh those are great questions um you, do you take on different personas in your situations i absolutely adapt my communication style depending on who i'm talking to i i i try very hard not to be directive and give orders unless i absolutely need to but if we're having like a fight like a legitimate like our servers are down all the client stuff is down like everything's crashing like I'm going to have a sense of urgency and a sense of directness in my voice. But if we're doing a brainstorming retreat and I want people to feel comfortable and get their creative juices going, I have a very different approach there. Yeah, so absolutely. And I would I would say, you know, it mirrors that situation that uh, every situation is going to have its own specificities and needs. And so you are you are constantly adjusting how you address people and and i think uh, you you've probably experienced this too but you know we come in i just wrote a a, a uh i haven't sent it in yet but i just wrote a, a, a article about um you know how we often revert to medical lead, what i call medical leads we we revert to our technical jargon often and it's very useful when we're talking to somebody who knows it well and because it's efficient, right? It helps you efficiently. But I can't do that to a patient or their family, even a fellow physician, unless they're a neurosurgeon, they don't know all that I'm talking about. So you really have to adapt to the, the situation, the needs of the situation, and then the sophistication of your audience, right? And uh, and and break things down, make them more simple if they need to be. Whereas there are other times, as you say, and, you know, be very encouraging and listen and open up and all that sort of thing. And then there are other times, and I, I would say, I agree, the OR is almost a dictatorship. Uh, okay. We try to make it feel, you know, warm and, and, uh, and, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk in, in the realm of patient safety that it has to be a situation like uh, a uh, before taking off in an airplane where you know anybody in anybody working for a, for the plane is allowed to say to the pilot, "I don't feel safe about this. The winds are too strong, or whatever." And the pilot's supposed to listen, and and you know that's supposed to be going on in the OR as well. And I think we try. But there are you are certainly going to be very directive uh, in many times. I, I, you know, there's not a lot of debate when, you know, when you say, give me the five rotin. <laughs> are you sure you don't want an eight? Rotin? No, I <laughs> Let's don't. talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so that's like a unilateral one direction. And then when you're having a conversation with the family, it's almost like a it's like a normal conversation, two way street type of thing. Absolutely. And you, you know, uh, I put in the article, but you're not doing that family any good if you're not addressing their concerns. You may have a message you want to get to them yeah. and that you're going to give it to them. But but if you haven't addressed what's their concerns, their worries are, your conversation is worthless. Yeah. Do you so I mean, do you get training for that? Or I guess are you, you are saying you're talking about stereotypes and doctors being pegged as jerks and all this stuff. Um, is that, is that, let me think of my question. Like, I wanna know if that's true, but also I assume that to be at a top level, you have to have a certain level of confidence and a certain level of, I'm gonna walk in here and operate on someone's brain. That takes a little bit of a bravado, if you, if you will. So where do you come out on that? Yeah, that's a, it's also a great question. I'll, I'll step back and answer one of your other questions. No, we don't get any training. <laughs> They, they, there is no real 
uh, in-depth addressing of this. I think it's a real sh shortcoming. Yes. Now we certainly, I mean, we certainly did it in our in our residency, but I think this came out of more the burnout than anything else. In that, uh, you know, our studies of burnout and what we started doing is practicing our residents through all sorts of complex conversations. So we would have them, uh, we would do play acting, whatever you call it, role, role playing. Play. There yeah, you go. Uh, we would role play and our PAs were wonderful about it. They would be the P physician assistants. They would uh, play the part of a patient. It could be a patient that you're telling them has a brain tumor or that their family member is paralyzed or they're drug seeking. They want you to give them more oxycodone. Um, but one way or the other, we would have the PAs play a part and the residents would have to, you know, talk to them and we would do it in front of everybody and critique it. Uh, so we did do it, but I, that's an anomaly that it certainly didn't come out of med school and, and uh, never came out of my training. That's for sure. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we're doing, hopefully there are places doing it like yes. we did and certainly something that we've tried to trumpet to, to yes. work now, on. Yes. Now, just to jump in, I will tell you, if I had the choice of someone who had great bedside manner or the technical skills, I would want them to have the, be competent in the technical pieces, but, you know, on health grades and all the stuff, it's like, how, how did you feel like they spent time with you? Did you feel like they listened to you? Um, how was their bedside matter? That's actually a, a category um, for some uh, doctors. So, um, <laughs> and I, I had worked with a, a voice coach, you know, a couple of years ago, just on presentations and such. And he was telling me about another client of his being a physician and I thought oh that's interesting are they like speaking about stuff they're like no she wanted to know how to better communicate the news to the families because she got feedback that that was that was not her strong suit and I was like interesting okay so she went to a yeah to that. And yeah you absolutely see uh physicians that are god awful at it they tend to break into medical ease they tend to go to the patient you have you know we just found out you have a glioblastoma and we are going to do a gross total resection, but you have to realize there'll be residual. So we will, uh, you know, go to adjunctive therapy and, and wow. you know, it's going to involve an accolading agent. And, and the, I mean, just roll out the stuff that I would understand, but the patient is just like a deer caught in the headlights. So yes, absolutely. But to get back, you know, to get back to your second question on that, well, then now I'm going to address another thing. I agree that you want somebody who's technically good, but I think if somebody is communicating like that, that may be a sign that they're not as invested in you as you might like them to be. Uh, I think somebody who can get to our level and discuss it with us and allay our concerns, they may actually care more about us and the you know, our, our personal outcomes uh, in the OR. So. I'll take a good surgeon with a great, you know, bedside manner over a renowned surgeon with an awful bedside manner because I'm not quite sure they're into me. Okay. You know, if that makes yeah. any sense. But uh, your other question, though, was you know some of the the attributes like confidence. Uh, I absolutely believe I I have a whole talk on giving bad news or I call it breaking bad. It's breaking bad news. Um, but confidence is important because if you're coming out to tell a family something awful and it doesn't appear that you're confident in your oh, message, yeah. what they're not going to take it. They're not going to believe it. They're not going to invest themselves in it. And there's a lot of things that go along with that confidence. You, you, it's in also imparting to them that you're competent, that you know what you're doing so they can take what you're saying you know, to the bank. And, and what we were just talking about before is also the idea of clarity. You don't want to speak in medical ease. You've got to adjust to their level of uh, sophistication um, and, uh, and you know, spell it out as cleanly as you can. You got to be consistent. You can't come in at one point and tell them one thing and then the next time taste, tell, say something totally different. Oh, yeah. You got to be upfront and honest. So... Because uh, there's a lot, there's there's neurosurgeons, or uh, not just neurosurgeons, there's physicians out there who, out of, I think, their own anxiety and vulnerability, don't want to say the bad stuff. They don't want to be 
as honest as possible. So all of a sudden, they'll open the door to a lot of false hope. Okay, you, you know, your loved one is paralyzed, but, you know, they may get better where we know darn well they're not going to get better. But there's a one in a million chance. What, it, yeah. what the heck does that mean? So you got to be kind of brave to be honest. And, and part of that honesty also, I'm sure you've seen, you've been in this position is, you know, there's a lot of things I don't have the answer for. I don't know. And you got to be willing to say when you don't know, if it's my job to know, I better go figure it out. But one way or the other, you can't predict everything. You can't tell what's going to happen all the time. So sometimes you just have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. This is what we think but we're liable to change our opinion. Yeah, that reminds me so much of clients I coached during COVID because they were getting questions for like, oh, do, are we gonna, gonna keep our job? Are we going under? Like investors were like, are we getting the government funding, et cetera? And they had to confidently go out there and confidently say, I don't know. And here's the factors I'm looking at and here's when we'll meet next. But they had to, you know, I'm in control. We're gonna handle this, but I don't know the answers to that right now. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I mean, COVID is such a great example of a lot of failures, right? But, but I, I thought the CDC was awful in its messaging. And, and I, I would have appreciated much more had they at the very beginning said, we don't know. This is, this is a crazy new disease. We are still figuring it out ourselves. We will tell you what we do know, and we're going to change what we do know. So, you know, right along with us but it, it really i i think it, a lot of pain could have been helped if uh, the messaging came out much better so i know we're rounding on time but i'm going to ask you one more question because i have a doctor here so so uh we'll go right up to time but uh, i've heard you talk about this before so i know that you you talk about it as a doctor um who is seen as a a, a science field where do you come down on religion or spirituality or or all of that? Because I'm really interested in in your opinion specifically. <laughs> so we're we are shifting gears. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's my first answer is it's complicated. I <laughs> that always helps. So I think how this one came about was in addition to the burnout books, I just put out a novel. And the novel's about a neurosurgeon, uh, believe it or not, who uh, begins to see ghosts. And the question is, you know, he's clearly burned out. The question is, is he slipping into psychosis uh, or could the ghost be real? And I love playing with the concept of, you know, why do we have to assume he's crazy? And even, you know, in the, in the book, uh, in the book, there's there's some real concern. Well, if your neurosurgeon is seeing ghosts, you know, are they competent to operate, for example? You know, can, are, is, might they go completely off, off the rails or something? And yet, you know, there are many societies in the, in the world, England included, where, you know, if you say, I just saw a ghost, people are like, oh, hey, that's cool. I, have, I wish I saw one. Uh, you know, there, I mean, there's a, a total belief. So anyway, I love playing with that concept and the idea that uh, also what is actually more scary, the, the neurosurgery that I put a lot of in the book or, or the, the supernatural. But anyway, to, to get to kind of the neuroscience side of this, the concept that somebody could see something and fully believe that what they saw was real, like I saw a ghost or I had a religious experience or, or whatever, the concept that that could be generated out of our brains, just, you know, the brain just projects it up on the movie screen and, and you buy into it is certainly very possible. We do it, all of us do it in our dreams, right? I mean, right. you, know, you can have very realistic dreams and you can, oh, yeah. therefore your, your brain is capable of creating any scenario basically and giving you a nice uh, 3D movie of it, uh, you know, no matter what. So I think what happens in neuroscience is even though we don't know a lot, there's, you know, there's stuff that may never get figured out, like what is conscious, you know, what, <laughs> what is our consciousness? We, I, 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 I don't know if we'll ever figure that out uh, because it is hyper complex system. And I would also argue that, you know, I, well, we'll get there in a second. So anyway, but 
amongst the neuroscience world and amongst the science world in general, I think there's a there's an overconfidence, almost a hubris that we can figure every eventually we'll have it all worked out. We'll have the, you know, the networking diagrams and the, you know, the electrical connections and the, you know, the capacitors and all that. We'll have it all wired out and, and we'll know exactly, you know, everything. And therefore, nothing beyond our experience could possibly exist. It's it, these things, you know, they're all going to be physical manifestations of our physical world. And I, I mean, I think that's the going theory amongst most scientists that everything else, supernatural, paranormal, spiritual, religious, is just, you know, BS. It's, it's just a creation of our minds. But I, I don't know, when I look at it from a neuroscience side itself, I kind of go, wait a minute, we, know, we don't know a lot of things about our brain, but we know our brain's filter out a huge amount of what we're encountering. The brain tries to present to us, talk about getting out of medical ease and simplifying things. Our brain simplifies everything that we experience. For example, I can't see infrared, I can't see ultraviolet, but it's there. And so it's, we, have a, we have a imperfect machine, us, our brains, to try to figure out this existence uh, for what it is. Um, and so I'm not confident that our brains will ever come to a point where you can disprove religion or disprove a spiritual experience or disprove supernatural. I just don't think that's capable. It also goes against science in general. Sam, I'm, a, I'm on a soapbox about this, but it also goes against science in general, which is not designed to um, to give an absolute truth. Mm. Science isn't there to say, this is absolutely the way it is. It's what the way science works is to set up a hypothesis that is kind of the opposite to what your theory is and knock that hypothesis off. They call it the null hypothesis. Meaning we can hopefully tell you what it's not, but we're not good at in the end, it's telling you exactly what it is. And if you look at a lot of science over the years, there'll be dogma. We know exactly what's going on. And then 10 years later, they Changes. go, nope, nope, it's not that at all. Uh, so. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I've, I've heard it described as there's science and then there's scientism, which means you can reduce everything to the scientific method. Um, and what you just said, as a doctor, you said, hey, you know, Science allows us to answer a lot of how questions, you know, how does the brain work? How does how do these systems in the body interact? And to me, there's 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 bigger universal questions like why? Like why why are we here? Why do we have brains? Right. You know, all of all of those things. So and I often hear I often hear like, do you believe in science or spirituality? And I'm like, mm, I, I, I reject the premise of that question, because I think it's a, a false choice. I think you can and should have both. I mean, if, if you're uh, a rational person, you can still be spiritual. If you're a spiritual person, you can certainly still be into science. And so um, I think that they answer very different questions, but they're actually complementary. So uh, I, I was just really interested in, in your take on that. But it sounds like you're, you're open to things that we can't perceive in our senses so we can't perceive you know ultraviolet or infrared with our eyes we can't hear certain frequencies with our ears maybe there's something else there that we just can't perceive with our minds or consciousness exactly exactly and uh i think we're we, we're both coming from the same angle on that which is always dangerous because then you just agree <laughs> with each other and yeah yeah no you're yeah you're right but i heard a uh Oh, I got a couple of pieces on that for you. One is I, I was reading an article. I think I may have told you about this, but I was reading an article by some astrophysicist, you know, and I, it's funny because neurosurgeons get thrown in with rocket scientists, you know, as being some, <laughs> you know, the epitome of brilliance. I think we get that simply because the organ we work on, you know, oh, well, if you work on the brain, you, you know, you must be, be the, the sharpest tool in the shed. 
And then, of course, in medicine, they call us technicians. But one way or the other, we're somewhere probably in between. The, uh, the this article from this astrophysicist, he was a he was a hypothetical astrophysicist, or I don't know what they call it. But anyway, he was hypothesizing that uh, there are multiple dimensions or multiple universes yeah. that could exist, and each each and they're infinite. They're infinite. And each one differs from the other, from the one next to it by one atom or something, or one, you know, positron or whatever they deal with. And I'm sitting there reading this and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this, this, this is no different from me, you know, saying that, you know, a cow out in that field is uh, is a deity because I, <laughs> I I can't prove either of these. I'll never be able to prove either or disprove either. It, it felt like very much a religion, and and so anyway, the the way I came at it, that sort of the the angle I come at it is I kind of feel when somebody is that dismissive of anything that's mm. not immediately in front of you that that's just another form of religion. You're putting your faith in something you cannot prove. Uh, and, and you know, that's kind of what religion is. Once, if you can prove it, well, then it becomes science. Then you can study it. But if you can't prove it, that's faith. But it seems like, it seems like the people who are that certain are just exhibiting another faith. So I was talking to, it was actually on a podcast, but I was talking to somebody who, who gave a great description of what I think I am, because I surrender. I, you know, when you said the why, why do we have this? I've tried to think about it, and eventually my brain starts to melt out of my ears. So I, I say, okay, I give up. I'm not going to try to figure it out. It would be nice when I'm gone if somebody would explain it to me, but, but I'm not even going to try. And anyway, this this podcaster described my kind of my approaches an optimistic agnosticism. Uh, and I like that. I am kind of optimistic that there's stuff out there, uh, but I just don't know and I'm not going to be able to know. Well, I don't know either. And I all, I mean, I, I, I search for answers, but at the end of the day, I know it's going to come back to, I don't know for sure. And I kind of sit there and go, you know, are we just physical beings? Is it just like synapses firing or is there you know, we, we have imagination, um, we have dreams, we have, uh, you know, happiness, we have, you know, mathematics is kind of an intangible thing if you think about it too. So yeah. we have all these qualities in us. Um, so part of me goes, mm, there's something, there's something else there. But it sounds like uh, we're, at the end of the day, we both don't know, but we're still kind of doing optimistic doing, about yeah, it. Yeah, optimistic <laughs> and doing what we can, which I think is a is a good tack too. So um, Gary, is Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we went a bit longer than normal, but that was just because you were offering some really interesting and valuable information and I was I was enjoying the conversation. So um, I really appreciate it. If people want to know more about you or your burnout books or any other resources you have, what's the best place to find you? Uh, the, the best place is I have a website. Uh, it's just my name, Gary, G-A-R-Y-R. As Simmons, it's spelt like Simon, so it's Gary R S I M O N D S uh, dot com. That one's pretty easy. Yeah, um, yeah and I, I hope they check out the novel. I actually really, I love the novel. the The other books I like a lot, but they were kind of like doing book reports. But I really enjoyed, you know, writing the novel. I'm gonna check out the novel just as you described it. So we'll have all the information to connect with you in the show notes. So if you're listening, please, please check out. Gary's books, especially his novel. And Dr. Gary, thank you once again. Thank you so much, Emily. This episode is brought to you by Next Level Coaching. If you or anyone you know would like to learn more about executive leadership coaching, please visit www.nextlevel.coach.